Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. You know, there's always been concerns about free speech and protests on college campuses, especially since the 1960s. However, in the last decade or so, there's been growing concerns about freedom of speech and expression on college campuses. Where well, joining me in a conversation is Zach Greenberg. He's a senior program officer for student organizations and campus rights advocacy for the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. Zach, thanks you so much for joining the conversation. Thank you for having me, Bob. Well, so just how serious today is the issue of free speech on campuses? Is it really, has it always been somewhat of an issue, but indeed, uh, is the intensity, is it more of an issue today than it was a decade or so ago? It's a huge issue today. Surveys the FIRE has done have shown that many students do not feel comfortable speaking out on a college campus. They feel that even holding controversial views could put them in danger. And at FIRE, our goal is to educate students. It's to ensure that students are able to have their full array of free speech rights on college campuses. And it's to ensure that individuals are able to speak out about the issues that they are most passionate about. You know, one of the interesting things in some of the surveys I saw, and it's kind of ironic, college students themselves, of course, say at the levels of 87%, well, of course we want free speech on campus. Of course people should be able to express their opinions. But my goodness, that high poll number in terms of what they want is certainly, you don't see it in practice. Right. There's a lot of misconceptions out there among the public educators, universities, and students about what exactly the free speech, the freedom of speech actually means. What is the First Amendment? What does it entail? What does it protect? And FIRE's goal is to educate the public to ensure that individuals have a working understanding of the First Amendment of free speech. And it protects speech that people may perceive to be offensive. It protects allegedly hateful speech. It protects a wide array of, of ideas and opinions and views that many people find to be offensive or distasteful. And we try to encourage people to use their own speech. The answer to speech you don't like is always more speech and not censorship or violence. You know, when I was a I remember it well. I was, in, uh, I was in my sophomore year at Wake Forest uh, political science class. And one of the professors says, if there is such a thing as truth, it results from the clashing of ideas. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, and I don't know, it probably wasn't original to him, but it always stuck with me that that's where one can really get to the center of it. But certainly, um, even in my instruction, um, <laughs> those days had kind of passed in terms of the tolerance there. But is it the information that is expressed or is it how the emotion? Is it more how something is said rather than actually the speech itself in terms of content? Like you said, the pursuit of truth, truth has nothing to fear from free speech. Many universities actually devote themselves to the pursuit of truth and the free change of ideas. But you're right. It's not about what sets, but how you say it. It's about phrasing the idea, the context, the perspective, what's actually being said. And on a college campus, we feel that students should be the most free to discuss the widest array of ideas in any manner they see fit, whether it's in class, whether it's with protests, billboards on signs, whether it's with, with armbands and tattoos and any way that shows how they express themselves. So while the, the content of the speech was actually being said is very important, like you said, the, the context, the method, the median of the speech is also of paramount importance. Well, is this... And it seems to be portrayed, depending on which side you're on, is this a liberal conservative kind of, of issue or is the abuse, if you use that word, same on both sides? Is there a liberal conservative component to this? Sure. Based on FIRE's research, our cases, we found that censorship is unfortunately a bipartisan issue. We have cases regarding individuals being censored across the political spectrum, whether they're liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican, you can think of virtually any single viewpoint that's been expressed in the college campus. And there have been individuals trying to get them to shut up, sit down and be punished for their views. So at FIRE, we are a proudly nonpartisan organization. We believe that the freedom of speech uh, ignores the benefit of all those across the political spectrum. And we defend individual rights, regardless of what they say, 
as long as they are protected by free speech in the First Amendment, which has us defending uh, a wide array of individuals, um, pretty much any viewpoint out there. Uh, Fire will defend uh, vegans, hunters will defend liberals, will defend communists, will defend um, people on both sides of the Palestinian Israeli debate. We will defend a um, wide variety of individuals because uh, free speech, so freedom of speech as a principle, um, should be applied neutrally. Now, this may be somewhat of a, an odd question, but, but in terms of the experience, is this an issue that seems to be more in terms of public institutions or private institutions? Is there a, a, a geography aspect? Does it seem to be more tension um, in the Northeast or the West Coast or the South? I'm just curious if there are certain parts of the country or types of institutions where speech seems to be more contested. That's a great question. Taking a step back for a second, public institutions, state universities are bound by the First Amendment. They're legally required to provide students their full array of free speech rights. Private schools are not bound by the First Amendment. They can put other values above the freedom of speech. However, the vast majority of private schools out there and the most prominent private universities, your Harvard, your Yale's of the world, do promise free speech in their official written policies. And students at these universities reasonably expect them to uphold free speech as if they were bound by the First Amendment. They're contractually bound to provide students with these rights. And based on our in our research in our cases, it seems to be an issue that affects all schools, public and private, mm-hmm. coast to coast, uh, big cities, small cities, big schools, small schools, um, from your community colleges to your Harvard laws of the world. Um, many of these schools are just very, very bad places for free speech, not only in terms of their policies, but also the culture of free speech at these institutions. And FIRE tries to work with these schools to make them a better place for free speech, allows them to express themselves. And we like to work with administrators to uh, reform their policies to eliminate those speech codes, these restrictive rules that uh, squelch students' rights. You know, um, I'm assuming, and you said earlier on that this perhaps is, um, the focus is more in terms of students, and especially your particular uh, uh, job title. But um, I guess this is also a role of faculty in terms yes. of this issue as well. Absolutely, faculty have, their academic freedom rights, the, the freedom to, to research and teach and to express themselves on matters um, of public concern within their expertise. And we see a lot of cases of universities punishing faculty members for doing their job, for researching and debating controversial issues. And that's not okay because faculty members and their academic freedom are the lifeblood of the university. Their, their mission, their job is to push society forward, to create new areas of academic research and to educate their students. If they're unable to express themselves or to debate matters within their expertise, they're really failing that role. And the university is in turn failing its role as an educational institution. Well, now, before we look at some ways that speech is impacted from a, a systemic perspective, um, just to clarify, I mean, indeed, there should be or should there be limits to speech on campus? In other words, you're not advocating just anything, obviously, reasonableness, tolerance. I mean, in other words, I don't want people to get the impression that just anything goes. It's a good thing that the First Amendment has uh, its built in limits and exceptions that can be easily applied on a college campus. True threats, for example, you cannot threaten somebody with a serious intent to commit violence or intimidate them. Um, punishable harassment, severe, pervasive, directly offensive conduct can be punished. Um, your classic obscenity, child pornography, stuff like that. These are historical categories of limited scope that allow administrators to punish students for their speech. So no, we don't advocate for limitless free speech. The First Amendment is absolute. It has its limits. Um, but we do believe that these limits should be clearly defined and, and, and enforced in a, in a fair and just manner um, when it comes to student speech. And many times, the times you see administrators punishing students for merely offensive speech, merely speech that offends their classmates and their colleagues, which of course retains protection under the First Amendment. Um, You know, so 20 years or so ago, there were formalized speech codes, Mm -hmm. and now they don't want to call it speech codes, uh, like at Virginia Tech, there's the principles of community. Uh, 
<laughs> and they'll use that as principles of community. Now, wait a minute, you're getting, you're violating our principle community, which is, and then they'll go down the line, very subjective and enforcing. There seems to be this kind of wiggle room that we still are seeing what I would call speech codes. Absolutely. And you're exactly right. Where many of these speech codes that were perhaps named something different back then are now being repackaged as community values or as a mission statement or as some sort of honor code the students have to adhere to. And the reality is that if these policies are mandatory and they entail punishment and they restrict speech, they're speech codes. They're just the same thing as what they were for uh, the last uh, 20, 30 years. And, and the issue here is the universities can encourage students to be respectful and civil. They can encourage students to be um, you know, better human beings and not do X, Y, and Z, but students still retain the right to be uh, uncivil, disrespectful, still retain the right to speak truth to power and to exercise their free speech rights in a manner that may offend administrators. You know, uh, it seems like for a while there, it's about disinviting speakers. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly some that might need police protection and enforcement, things like that. But you don't see as many of those cases anymore. And I'm wondering, it's just, okay, to be careful, let's just not invite controversial people, which is a missed opportunity for some sort of engagement. But I don't see a lot of pronouncements about we are disinviting someone as we did, what, two or three, five years ago or so. Yeah, absolutely. This is the big issue, disinviting speakers. Universities and student groups invite speakers to campus to have a debate, to have a lecture, to engage in a free exchange of ideas and to, and to learn from each other. And whenever a university disinvites a speaker, it sends a chilling effect to everybody. It says that these kind of speakers, this category of speakers are not allowed here. We do not tolerate this version of their views and of their ideas. And that's really detrimental to students' free speech rights, because without engaging with those you disagree with, it's hard to learn anything. Without having discussion with those that hold opposing viewpoints, it's hard to really have your own worldviews challenged and be able to grow as human beings. And so while we've seen a lot of dissipation, especially during commencement season, we call it dissipation season of fire, um, during the last couple of years, we feel that the lack of dissipations recently can probably be chalked up to the chilling effect that schools are simply not even going to allow anybody to invite speakers. And if they do, the speakers they invite would be very uh, milk toast, very uh, mild and vanilla, not saying anything too controversial out here, um, which is really detrimental due to the free change of ideas on a college campus. You know, you're part of your responsibilities in terms of student organizations. Uh, my gosh, it seems like there's an organization for everything in the world. <laughs> yes, there is. Right. Um, make sense or, or not, but how much in terms of not approving student groups and organizations, is that um, still an issue and problem on many campuses? Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. My, my brother uh, went to Cornell University, Big Red, and there are over, I think, a thousand different student groups there, which is incredible. I don't know how you think of this stuff. There's competitive eating groups, there's chess clubs, there's athletic groups, there's everything you can even imagine um, there that students want to do. Um, but yeah, student groups, in my opinion, are the best way for students to get together, add their voice to one another, and, and be people that are like-minded. We talk about how universities, a lot of the, the learning happened outside the classroom. Well, it's happening in student groups, the leadership roles that students take in fraternities and sororities and the, the, the great projects they do with these academic societies and their athletic events. It's fantastic. And for universities to, to we see it a lot happen when they defund student groups, they take their money away, they take their recognition away, take away their rights to the protest and the function on campus because of opposition to their views. That's really detrimental to students' free speech rights because you have groups of students out there, sometimes two, three hundred students trying to have a group versus saying, we don't like this, we don't want this to be on campus. And now you're having a situation where student groups are becoming um, extinct and exterminated because people just don't want to like, they don't like them on campus. Administrators are hostile to them and they don't want them. Taking away the college public chapters or or making sure that TPUSA can't have their events, it's really a detrimental impact on free speech. And so I work with primarily um, student groups and ensure that their rights are protected, the associational rights are protected from association, They're able to express themselves on campus just like students are able to. Well, I, I spent 40 years in higher ed and uh, 34 years at Virginia Tech. 
Um, and I have to say that um, in terms when you're looking at professorial kind of uh, uh, intimidation, it seems very much so in the uh, humanities and, uh, and, and liberal arts that there's less uh, real intimidation at the professorial level. Mm -hmm. And I know that by one poll I saw 63% of students agree. 63% of students left, right, in between, whatever, agree that campus climate prevents them from speaking because it might offend others. There is this self-censorship that's the mainstay now, and I think primarily in the disciplines of humanities and social sciences. Definitely, based on the polls we've had as well, with a lot of students self-censor, they silence themselves, they want to talk about this. And it's interesting because we talk a lot about the culture of free speech, you have the law, right, the policies, the rules, but what does it mean to have a free speech culture? What does it mean to have a, a university that actually cherishes the free change of ideas? And at FIRE, we think it's about hearing out those you disagree with. It's about not demonizing your enemies. It's about having, it's about seeking out those with opposing views and having discussions with them. And we're seeing a lack of that in college campuses. We're seeing people deliberately avoid interacting with those that have opposing views, that only they, people want to go in their echo chambers to only befriend and, and associate and, and even date people that have the same views they do. And in a society as, as pluralistic as America, it's hard to believe that that won't encourage polarization and more strife and, and more instability. So when it comes to the culture of free speech, and, and instilling that is a long process and it takes a lot of work and effort. Of course, it is somewhat downstream from the rules but it's just incredibly important for students to understand um, why we have free speech and why it's important. You know, I spent uh, many years, uh, not only in support of, but it very much in, in um, working with the core cadets at Virginia Tech. And in the eighties, there were instances where cadets would actually report in some of the classes. And I will tell this, cause I, this, I, this was a true indication that two of the cadets went to a women's studies class. And it was in, uh, again, the eighties. And the professor was very kind, but she said, you cannot take this class. Mm -hmm. Well, we wouldn't tolerate that today, but there are other subtle right. things because you have to make a choice. You go in and you know either you can, you, you're going to learn and what have you, but you really can't challenge. And so that is something where it uh, becomes a, a, a very frightening in a way in terms of you're sitting there knowing that your particular perspective, you may not be disliked, or you will might be disliked because of your affiliation, especially if you're in a uniform. That's a great story with something similar when I was in college. You're part of the College of Libertarians. We used to go to the College Democrats and Republicans meetings to be like, hey, we're here, happy to debate, happy to talk. I know we're not of your political persuasion, but we want to just talk to you guys and see you know, what's up and whether we can have a debate or a round table or something. And it's great that people do go to classes that they may be unfamiliar with, that they may not understand, because that's how you learn. That's how you have a a, you know, a robust campus environment. And unfortunately, it seems to be going the opposite direction with, um, you know, these exclusive spaces and these um, disinvitations and just not really being accepting of those with opposing views. There seems to be an intensity. Um, we don't have persuasion anymore. That is facts, reason to influence your belief, attitudes, or values. And there's such an intensity that comes with that, which gets back to some of the display. But persuasion as an art, um, and even the discussion, it seems that um, that's lacking today in a way that I don't know how we get it back with the polarization that we have, the politicalization. Um, and it's just hard to see when I look at some of the profile of some of the uh, more recent millennials and Zoomers. Um, it's a very tough task indeed. Absolutely. The, the polarization and the, the refusal to talk across political boundaries is in many ways getting worse. And the intensity is also getting worse because, like you said, it seems to be that even just holding opposing views is, uh, is a sign of, uh, of, of intolerance or a, a, a makes you a racist or a sexist. Talk about cancel culture. I right? talk about um, people losing their jobs, getting expelled from campus for having these views. And I think it kind of goes back to how people view speech. We're having, there's a, there's a, a nation movement right now about people um, viewing speech as violence, as words that 
um, are offensive or actually physically violent. And it's really problematic because if you view speech as violence and you can react violently to that speech, which is the entire purpose of having civilization, right? It's to not do that, is to, is to react um, boards using more words, using um, the ballot box and not the battlefield to determine who's right, who wins and what ideas are, are accepted here. And it, it's really interesting because we, we encourage students, we encourage everyone to use their own speech, always use more speech, uh, not violence to, to, uh, to deal with those that are opposed to you or that are perhaps offend you. And it's really important for students to, to develop their facilities, to understand what logic is and how to argue, how to persuade, how to use your words to get what you want. That seems, it seems to be a lesson people learn in kindergarten, but perhaps forget in college um, about uh, the importance of words. And words are, of course, very powerful. They can drive people to madness, to suicide. So they're really, really powerful, really important, which is why they must remain free, which is why colleges should protect them. And, and it's why um, they have to maintain that, that very very distinct line between speech and violence. Well, you know, I'm going to, uh, now that I'm retired, I can make kind of a confession. And I also understand that there's a generational uh, a component perhaps to this. And being an administrator, I had the luxury I could. But the point I'm going to say is, uh, before my retirement, I quit teaching undergraduates. My particular method of dialogical uh, point, counterpoint, uh, playing devil's advocate, there was no tolerance for that, no tolerance whatsoever. Um, and the presumptions coming in with such closeness. And so um, I quit teaching undergraduates purposely. And of course, I'm now retired and I can say, I can say <laughs> that. <laughs> but that shows you, uh, from my experience, how difficult it was creating an environment that really saddened me, really saddened me. Yeah, yeah, it's funny how much college has changed. You know, the uh, law school, right? It's the, the Socratic method, um, you know, cold calling on students being like, hey, what do you feel about this? Like, out of the blue, just like that. Um, that's dying. You know, that's going away. It's, it's becoming a less of a, a standard method to use during law school. And uh, my dad tells a story where, you know, he at, at Hofstra when he was in law school, he was, um, there was this used to be a smoking lounge on campus where students could go to their professors and have a cigar or a cigarette and just relax and, and, you know, and talk about life and current events, Long Island. And nowadays there's uh there's smoke, there's a uh, tobacco free, smoke free zones. There's no real place where students can come and gather with professors and have these shared spaces and have these debates and dialogues and discussions. And it's really a shame because a lot of the college experience is having that back and forth, like point counterpoint in class, um, out to the classroom with your professors, with your fellow students, and that's kind of going away, um, which is, I think, detrimental to students' free speech rights and even just for becoming uh, adults and productive members of our society. We complain in society that we got all these, quote, echo chambers, but I tell you, one of the loudest echo chambers is a college campus, in my humble opinion. We only have about three minutes or so left. I, what, what should students do if they really find themselves um, uncomfortable, hostile environment? Should they uh, tell their parents? Should they go to the dean of students? In other words, advice you would give uh, students at this point, and I'll ask the same in terms of faculty. Sure. Um, FIRE gives students a lot of credit. We think they are strong enough to withstand offensive speech, they're mature enough to understand, to react to that speech with speech on violence. And they're wise enough to, to figure out why somebody is offending me and what they're saying and how we can learn from that experience. We believe in the strong student model. Students um, should, should be rigorous. They should be, um, they should have somewhat of a thick skin and should be able to, to survive the rigors of a back and forth um, political environment. Um, however, if they are punished for exercising their free speech rights by their professors, their administrators, by their colleges, um, please contact us at thefire.org. We're here for you. We'll be your case. We, we, we'll see if we can help out. And on our website also, we have resources for students that are facing these issues. We have guidebooks. We have, um, we, 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 we have checklists. We have ways to start campus groups that, are, that, can, that can foster it, the culture of free speech on campus. And for, um, for faculty members as well, we ha also have resources. We have conferences. We have our faculty um, network. You can talk to like when a faculty, perhaps the situation you went through that can help you out, keep some advice like that. And so we have resources and when we hear for you, if, and if you, if at any point uh, students, professors do feel their rights are violated on campus, please contact us. We'll get back to you. We'll review your case. We can see if we can help um, in the court of public opinion, in the court of courts and um, any way we can do. 
Very good, very good. Well, our time is, is rapidly coming and in, in ending, and I really appreciate it. There's so much more that we could, could talk about. Well, I certainly want to thank my um, guest, Zach Greenberg, um, and I want to thank you for joining us and hope you will do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.